How do we open up our minds to allow all forms of information to come in? How can we open up our hearts in order to understand at a visceral level what life is about in any given moment? How do we open up our will to allow future possibilities to emerge? This is Prosperity and Something Greater. My guest today is Dr. John Gould. You're going to hear the story of how I met this remarkable educator over 20 years ago when he was working as a superintendent of schools, trying to bring his students, teachers, parents, and stakeholders into a new way of thinking about schools that created meaningful learning within the school. And believe me, even in the late 90s, for John Gould within the school had nothing whatsoever to do with the four walls of a traditional classroom. John is one of the smartest people I've ever personally met. He is grounded in systems thinking, learning organizations. He's collaborated with Peter Senge, among many, many others. John is fun. He is always on the move, and he's thinking at least a decade farther out than almost anyone I know. So let's spend some time with this remarkable teacher. And I can tell you something, you're going to be listening to this episode more than once just to review what he has to say. I already have. John Gold. Okay, well, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Dr. John Gold, my friend. It is a delight to be on the call with you and to know that you're hanging out in Cape May and just enjoying everything about the shore down there. And John, welcome to the podcast. I've been looking forward to this so much. It is a pleasure to be here, Rem. Definitely. You know, I was. I would like to give you an opportunity to sort of recount how we met. Let's just kind of pick up the thread there and then we'll get into our questions about prosperity or maybe it'll even jump in real quickly. But do you remember? Yeah, I I was thinking about it. I think we met in the late 90s or mid 90s in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the host. And I think we were at a conference the, you know, because you were doing Classroom Connect at that time. And I believe it was Holly Joe that introduced us. And it was, yeah, real quick, oh, hi, you know, this is Rem, Rem blah, blah, blah. And and so we talked just for a little bit. And then what started to happen is I remember you asked me to do a presentation uh, for Classroom Connect. And I, I think it was down in Baltimore. It might have been, or what I'm a little confused about was, because the next time you had me come down to, I think it was Dallas, when you were toying with the idea of creating Classroom Connect University, if you remember. That's where our partnership really developed. And then you eventually went out to uh, San Francisco when Classroom Connect was bought. Uh, We were doing some work out there. And then we kind of like lost connection for a while. And then the next thing, I'm looking in the Lancaster newspaper. I don't remember what it was. And then all of a sudden I see there's Rem Jackson's picture, and you were starting this new work in Lancaster. And then obviously we reconnected at that particular time being. So it it was kind of an interesting, you know, direction of where we, you know, where we're going. And and as I think about this, you know, you mentioned Dan Butner, who at that time, I think in Classroom Connect was doing those bicycle journeys that that kids would, you know, he was in Egypt or wherever he was, and kids then would connect on the internet on those journeys. And I was thinking about Dan has migrated and eventually started the Blue Zone. And I know National Geographic, and he was very, very, you know, big in, into that. And as I think about Rem Jackson right now, because I see you as the consummate entrepreneur, it's so interesting to see that you went from basically working with educators to lawyers to podiatrists, just this interesting migration. 
And my sense is right now that Rem Jackson, whereas Dan Buettner had the blue zone, I'm seeing the Rem Jackson as starting the concept of the prosperity zone. Oh, so, I like that. Yeah. So, so that's how I see our migration. And, you know, we've always connected and, you know, I guess we're kindred spirits, actually. And it doesn't matter when we don't see each other. We, we're always connected in some, some form or fashion. Oh, it's so true. And I've had so many wonderful conversations with you. You're one of the smartest people I know. And I just love the way your mind thinks. And I love, you know, all of the conceptual work that you've done over all the years I've learned. I've learned as much from you as anyone I've ever met, John. You are, you're one of my heroes in that regard. And, you know, I remember our meeting just a slight bit differently. I remember the Dallas meeting for sure. But I remember saying to my stepfather, Dr. Robert Coldiron, You know, we need, we were building Connected University for Classroom Connect, which was online, which was online learning, which at the time barely existed. There was something called Ziff Davis University, and we were using that as a sort of a model. And so he I said, do you know anybody that, that knows anything about like technology and education that would be helpful? Because we really need, we need instructional design. And he goes, well, he says, I'll tell you, I talked to John Gold because you know, and he knows you. He worked down there. My uh, stepfather is a retired expert in educational testing. He knew you were around. And what he didn't tell me at the time is that you were actually a rabble rouser. <laughs> John's my favorite educator. He, is, he has been burned at the stake several times by trying to lead people into change. And they say, we really want this change. And then he starts to change and they get out the pitchforks and they burn him at the stake. I've seen it happen a couple times with you. And it's just fabulous to watch your career and um, all that you've done. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting about that when you say burn at the stake. So I remember I wrote a grant to start connecting our elementary and our high school and our middle school together using a BBS system way back. You're going to have to define that. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah. So I tell my students that this and they look at me like, what in God's name is a BBS system? And I said, well, it's a bulletin board system. It was the forerunner to email. And so what I was doing was connecting teachers in different buildings together to begin to share information. So, you know, that that was my first foray into it. And then then what happened was I was able to get a whole group of people together, school districts together, to put up, believe it or not, venture capital with a company in Lancaster where we created, if you remember the RCA video disc? Sure. We created a teacher development program because RCA was in battle, I guess, with with Sony on who was going to win. And obviously Sony won. But and, and we were able to integrate that video disc into an Apple um, 2C or whatever they were at that time. And it was a teacher training program on how to expand their teaching strategies. And then my next foray, so, so that went along kind of interestingly. And there's only one copy of it left, and it's still at Millersville University in the library. Wow. The whole, and then my, my other foray into that was... Our school district, when I was superintendent back in uh, 2000, 2001, we granted a charter to a cyber charter school. And I spent a year around the state of Pennsylvania in more courtrooms because the school boards association sued us, sued everybody. And I'll still never forget this, that the, at that time, the solicitor for The school boards association said to the judge that it will never, ever happen that we will be learning online. Yeah. Yeah. Just think of that. You know, and it just, it's still in my mind that I just sit there and just, okay, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. June 2nd, 2020, and online learning has become so, it's become utterly, utterly necessary. It's, It's having a moment, isn't it? Yeah, well, you figure I, I teach at Drexel now after I left the superintendency and our program, our master's program and also our doctoral program uh, is totally online. And so we've been doing that at Drexel for 20 years. You know, we, we've been working that way. We we understand the process. Uh, 
you know, and the technology has advanced so well in relationship to video conferencing and the ability to get as close as you can to face to face that, you know, we, we, we have 300 students in our EDD program. So that says something, yeah. you know, in terms of that. So well, you and I've had a, an awful lot of fun also over the years. You're, I consider you one of my best friends. And I remember one story I'll tell myself. So one time I was at the San Francisco office of Classroom Connect, which, of course, the K-12 company I had to do. And John, I said to John, what do you want to do when you're here? And he says, well, you know, I think it'd be kind of fun to go to a Giants game. And I'm like, OK. I said, oh, I don't know much about football, but I'll see if I can get tickets. And then John pauses for me and he goes, Rem, Giants are a baseball team. Yeah. I learned that the Giants were a baseball team. But it turns out there is a Giants football team. And they're in New York, the other coast. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I'll never forget. I learned that that day. And I think I know a little bit more about sports than I used to, but it's not necessarily my strong suit. So I, I wanted to talk to you about this concept of prosperity and ask you, you know, having, you know, had the career you've had and all that you've, you've accomplished. And, you know, and I, you're at your home down there, Cape May, you have, you know, a home in Lancaster and, you know, you're just living that life. How would you define prosperity for you? It's interesting. And, and I'll, I'll say this. I have listened to all your podcasts before I came on because I just wanted to get a sense of the space of where it is. And what I found interesting, and, and I'll get to, to how I'm perceiving it, and you'll, you'll see this. For me, the concept is awareness, that to be prosperous, you need to be aware and you need to be present where you are in your environment. And I think that's important. And the reason I say that is, as Native Americans say, I am in my 73rd spring. So, and, and the way I look at that is that, you know, I listen to other people and my sense is they are definitely younger than I am and their experiences within the now, a lot of times are age related. And, and most people have been talking about, it's not about money. It's not getting money. And people say it's satisfaction. It's, it's a sense of who one is. And I think that's true as at my age, I really see that what prosperity for me is, and I, and to tell you the truth, when I create the atmosphere for my students to learn, that is an important question for them to think about. Because the question there for me is, how do I open up my mind to allow information to come in, all forms of information? And then how do I open up my heart in order to understand at a visceral level, what life is about in any given moment? And then how do I open up my will to allow future possibilities to emerge? Because when you're open to, to this concept of open mind, open heart, and open will, which is not my concept, but, but it comes out of some of the work of Otto Scharmer, what, what it does is it allows you to become attuned to the here and now but it also allows you to understand your intentionalities, what drives you. And I think it was Socrates that always said that, you know, an unexamined life is a life that's not worth living. And to me, it, it, as an educator, it, it's very important to nurture the inquiry of every human being to find out who they are and how they fit the larger system in which they live in. And obviously we live in many types of systems and families and we belong to social organizations, we belong to work patterns, we belong to educational organizations. And a question for me that what prosperity is about is the understanding of my values and how they relate to other people and how I allow myself to relate to them so I can hear who they are. So I think that's, you know, it, it you know, might sound esoteric, but it isn't because I live it. You know, I, I experience it as I reflect upon my life over all of these years. My sense is the more I can delve into that and understand those 73 years, 
obviously maybe take away four years when you're young. You don't have the, you know, the, the, the verbal skills at that point to be able to articulate it. But um, I, I think that that to me is what underpins prosperity for me. So it's not about money. It's now money might come along, you know, you're, you know, because of the way we socially look at things. But I, I really feel that, yeah, I'm prosperous. If you look at it from a materialistic point of view, you know, I got two houses, I have a freaking sailboat, you know, all these things. But those things just came about because, you know, they were there for me. And, you know, I was rewarded because of things that I do, but that's not what's important because they're all, you know, they, they're fleeting. I could lose those in a moment, but I cannot lose my soul of who I am. That's what the more important thing is. So that's what I look at prosperity as being. And now everybody just got a little taste of why I enjoy talking to you so much. And it's even better, folks, I will tell you, when you're into your second bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon as well. <laughs> and that's true. So John, let's go back a minute. What was the defining moment or event that brought you to your career path? Well, you know, that, it's interesting because as I was thinking about that question a lot, I always say to my students that I graduated second in my class. And, you know, their initial response is, um, Wow, man, you must have been smart, you know, you know, second year class. And then I pause and I say, no, from the bottom. I was second from the bottom in my class. And then I also go on and say to them, and I said this even when I was a superintendent of schools, when I was introducing, you know, to the staff and all this. And then I'd say to them, I also want you to understand I flunked out of college twice. So I got kicked out of the seminary. I was going to become a priest. And then the Pope goes because I flunked Latin and Greek. And then the Pope goes and changes everything to English. So, you know, so, so what? And then what happened was that experience in, in the seminary really, you know, it, it kind of stunted my growth, so to speak, as a human being. Uh, no offense to any Roman Catholic priest out there, but uh, my, my sense is, you know, I didn't know what to do. And so I ended up, I, I went to Trenton Junior College. I actually got 33 credits in biology because I love biology. I just love studying life and all those things. And then I ended up at Duquesne University. I joined this organization that was an anti-fraternity, which is normal for me, called the Sheiks. And so I spent more time with that and got kicked out of there. But what happened was, and, and, and this is how my life story to stay in education happened, was that at the time I had an AS degree. And in the Catholic school system out there, you could teach with an AS degree. So I got a job teaching in an all girls high school in Pittsburgh. And that changed my life really dramatically because what happened there was for some reason, I started to understand what learning was about. And at the time I was a teacher and I was teaching sciences and I was teaching social studies. Because, you know, that's the way the system was about. But then I was able to get into a small liberal arts college called La Roche College, which is Allison Park. And I was one of the first males because the, the La Roche College was becoming co-ed. So I was one of the first males coming in there. And what happened was, for some reason, something clicked in me. And I graduated magnum cum laude. And then I went to, to Duquesne University, and I did my master's in one year, part-time, with a 4-0, okay? Now, there's a very interesting part to this story. Then I got accepted into the PhD program full-time at Pitt, but I was teaching, and I loved teaching. For some reason, I just, you know, teaching became very interesting for me. So I got accepted in the part-time program, of which I completed my PhD part-time in three years. And what was interesting about that is that I always say that was in 1976 because that was the year Pitt won the national championship with Tony D. So, so you know, those things click in your mind. But what was more important than getting that PhD? I got a letter from Duquesne University saying that, well, it's been about five years since we basically kicked you out, and maybe you'd like to come back 
to continue your undergraduate degree. And it, you know, that got me to the point. I saw the letter because that was more important than my PhD because I got a master's degree at their program. They had no idea that I got that. And I'm getting this thing because it shows the disconnect within any type of organization. And so what's happened to me in my journey in education was, you know, I became a consultant outside of education. Matter of fact, remember when when New York City had had the major blackout, I think in seven, yeah. seven or whenever. So I had this job with this consulting firm to go into and work with Con Ed. And what I discovered was I honestly don't like living out of a suitcase, you know, and traveling a lot. So I lasted maybe two months there. And then I got back into education and I just stayed there because my goal was because I flunked out. The system did not know how to deal with me because there's quite a few kids like me. And I was going to go in there and I was going to change that system or at least get people to begin to understand that. And I've had success as a superintendent. I've had failure as a superintendent dealing with that. My greatest uh, claim to fame as a superintendent was in the small school district where I literally, after working with teachers for three years, just nurturing them to think of new ways of doing this, that they went to the school board and asked to have the walls knocked down between their classrooms. This is in 2002. And I had a good school board then, and they allowed that to happen because they were looking at kids differently. So I I kind of began to understand that as a leader, what happens is you need to create the space for people to emerge in terms of who they are, and you nurture that. So if you look at that in terms of prosperity, that's how I see it. It, It's the ability to nurture in yourself, but also create the space to nurture in other people to find out who they are and to create the condition for that growth to happen. So it can be in a school, it can be in a family, it can be in a business, it could be anything. You know, I think about you, you know, your, your, your talent is basically nurturing people to, you know, to express who they are. And so the, that to me, I think is, is where my life journey went. Then I got sick of a superintendency because I also had trouble in the superintendency where I had, and I won't mention names or anything, but I had a school board member go after me. I mean, you know, Bob Casey is now the senator in Pennsylvania. He knew me as auditor general because this guy was accusing me of stealing money from the school district, et cetera. And my only claim to fame as superintendent is I was the only superintendent that ever successfully sued and won a case against a school board member. So, you know, but what it did to me, because one of the things I didn't realize you know, they, you know, they always talked about Bill Clinton being able to put things into compartments. You know, that was happening to me and it was taking a toll on me psychically and I didn't realize it. So my last superintendency, I didn't realize it. I could care less about being a superintendent and I had my contract bought out. And then I ended up at Drexel because what happened there was I was a, you know, a good friend of mine able to get me in there. I was one of the only superintendents in the faculty at that time, you know, de- you know, developing this. And I helped to develop our EDD program, which was focused on nurturing the development of transformational leaders, not just in education, because I've had people from, from business environments, NGOs in there, in how do you deal with ambiguity, unpredictability, and now look at the state of where we are right now. Yeah. yeah just two major events that, that are there. So for the last 13 years, that's been my basic goal of trying to nurture the next generation of leaders. John, some folks, you mentioned it twice now. I just want you to do a quick definition of EDD program. Yeah, an EDD is a doctorate in education. So in education, there are two types of doctorates. One is a PhD which is a research degree. It's, it's where you're doing pure research, et cetera. So for example, I have a PhD. But an EDD, which I really enjoy, is where the researcher is part of the environment. They're in there. They're, they're part of it. So we have teachers and we have principals and we have administrators. We have business people who are going after that. So an EDD, a, a doctorate in education, 
is one that actually is working in the field. So they're in practice. Whereas a PhD, you're doing pure research. Great. Thank you. A lot of folks don't know that. Yeah. So listen, we all have challenges and we all have obstacles we face all the time. Can you share what can kind of trip you up on your daily journey? Ego. (laughs) Really, when you think about it, I always have to watch that. I've gotten better at it, you know, that I don't know everything. I probably don't know hardly anything, you know, but I have to keep reminding myself of that. I have to uh, become present. I have to, you know, be willing to hear other people. And right now, you know, as I think about it, and not to be political about it, but we live in such a time that our tendency is to, you know, spout our point of view without listening to the other side. And I have to constantly keep checking myself because that hurts people. That that That's what nurtures this bubbleism, we can call it. You know, we all live in these different bubbles and we only associate with people in our bubbles. And I consciously try not to do that. And I try to understand other people's points of view. And again, you know, when you come back to that idea of prosperity, as I said, what it is, is, you know, the unexamined life, you know, if you don't examine who you are and how you're functioning, then, you know, your life's not worth living to an extent. That was Socrates. So for me, I always have to guard myself, not, you know, taking on the role that I know everything. And I constantly keep working on the idea that, you know, go back to my graduating second in the class from the bottom. <laughs> so that keeps that that reminds me of that. You know, it, it keeps me grounded. So that that's that. And, you know, I it, it's funny. Um, you know, I, I listen to my students and stuff and I hear people. I, I think I've developed the philosophy that allows me to flow with the events and don't allow the events to, you know, consume me. And I think that's part of the ability to do that. And I think you just develop that over time. You you begin to understand your relationship or what's called nested in a living environment. And the more you understand that and that that we're all in a reciprocity point of view, that that we we you know we exchange in life, because that's what life's about. It's all about exchanges. And that my my sense is I try not to compromise anymore. Because what I've learned about compromising is what happens is in a compromise, everyone loses. Because you lose something. You know, you got to give something up. But I've developed a sense uh, of studying this work about regenerative life, that reconciliation is what happens in nature. And what reconciliation is, so if you think of Nelson Mandela, or what he did in South Africa, he, he had two choices. He, he could have nailed, you know, the oppressors, but no, he didn't. He brought people together to reconcile, to allow something new to emerge. And I think to me, that is the most important thing that, that we have to understand in my teaching of educators. I try to get them to begin to, to understand that in relationship, how they teach kids, you know, how we have to explore this. I talk to parents about it, you know, that, that what we're trying to do really is, is to, you know, the, the idea is when we're confronted with these things like the viruses right now, that instead of trying to problem solve it, what we should try to do is learn from it to see new possibilities. And and that has really, really starting to, you know, infiltrate my thinking in terms of how I deal with life right now. Well, you know, so, I mean, I would describe you as a wise person. And, and I'll tell you that, and the reason I say that is I say that about myself. I consider myself to be a wise person. And I'll tell you why. It was, I don't know how many years ago it was. It's quite a while ago. I, I realized one day I, I know a lot. I know a lot. I've learned a lot and I've studied a lot and I've thought a lot. And I realized that I know so much now that I realize I don't know hardly anything. And the minute, and this is referencing back to what you said, and the minute that you recognize that you don't really know that much, 
in all your great studies and everything we've done, you don't know that much. And you need to be open to, as you've talked about here, open and aware. That's the beginning of wisdom. And um, that's certainly something I believe that you, you've achieved. And, you know, and, you know, I've known you a long time, so I knew you before you were 73. You've been that way. Um, you've been so inquisitive and so interested in learning organizations and how can these systems grow. You've taught me so much about schools and, uh, and K-12 models. And uh, it's just been, um, it's been fascinating to, to watch. John, the people listening to this podcast, they're, I got a crew of them now that are really regularly listening, and they're interested in achieving their own version of prosperity. And you've already shared some really good stuff, but what advice do you have for them? Well, I, I guess just to circle right back to it is that you need to be aware. You need to be conscious of your environment. You need to be conscious of your value structures. Uh, you need to be conscious of how you fit in to the, uh, I'm going to use the word the environment, and I don't mean it in, in you know, uh, the ecology of where you live, who you are. You, you're aware of your relationships within your family or your relationships within your work or within your churches or, you know, your social organization. So the more you are aware and that you're, and again, I, I want to go back to the Socrates, that, that if you're, if you're not examining who you are in any given moment, now I don't mean you sit there constantly doing that, but that awareness is there. You will begin to discover who you are and how you relate to where you are. I'll put it that way. And when you're that way and you can begin to allow other people to see that that's how you are. So for example, I always say, I always say say to, to my students that when you're confronted with, you know, someone who, you know, it's just berating you or, or tearing you apart or whatever, is I always say to them, the best way to deal with that is just say, help me understand why you think that way. Because it changes the dimension of the relationship. You know, wait a second. Wait, whoa, you, you want to know why, why I'm thinking this way? You know, so, so that of being aware of my relationship to wherever I am, with the, if I'm thinking about my job, what I have to do there, or if I'm conversing with another person, or if I'm in within a group. So that's to me is what I would tell people to do. Be mind, you know, the, the, the buzzword we all use is mindfulness. That's really a good concept to think about, but it also means that I have to be self-reflective. I have to surface my assumptions. I have to understand the paradigms. I'll use the word the paradigms that I work from or I live from, how I look at the world. So if, if you think about in the political environment, you know, am I a Democrat? Am I a Republican? Am I independent? Well, yeah, but the question is, what's the values that I'm trying to bring across you know, to other people and that I'm truly interested in you so we can have a conversation or reciprocity between us can can take place. That's what I would say. Well, I can't add a thing to that. And I'm going to just ask you this next question, and you knew it was coming. If you were a toy, any toy at all, what would it be and why? A slinky. I, I always, you know, that's a, when I always hear you ask that question, first thing that comes to my mind, and don't ask me why, is a slinky. Because when I was a kid, I used to love watching those things just go down the step where you can put them in your, your hand and juggle them. So those of you who don't know what a slinky is, it was, it was kind of a giant spring that came together and you could put it at the top of the steps and it would just go down the step. Yeah. So those of you who like Google, look up a Slinky. Everybody had a Slinky. There were commercials on television with the Slinkies, and they walked down steps brilliantly. But here's the funny part. They really don't do anything else. <laughs> I mean, look, that's like the one trick a Slinky had. And whoever made it, man, they made a bundle on that brilliant idea. Yeah. Well, then so I, just I could say a pet rock. <laughs> yeah, sure. 
The other brilliant idea, and if you don't know why, pet rock to you sounds like a strange thing, and it could to a lot of people. It had its moment. I think it might have been in the 70s. Yeah, it made, again, an absolute fortune selling rocks to people. But no, I think a slinky probably would be be the best, uh, you know. Then maybe followed by uh, Tinker Toys. Those would be very yeah. Tinker Toys because you can yeah. buy stuff. So, okay, now I'm going to do this. You've probably recommended more books to me than any person I know, and I've got the library. I've got the the John Gould section <laughs> with Peter Sang. He's certainly a headliner in that section. But but if you had to pick one, John. One great book that we should all read or be reading, what would it be? Well, you see, you're 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 boxing me in on one because there's really two, I think. So the first okay. thing, you, you gotta give me, let me do two. So the first right. thing is because this lady is starting to really influence my thinking. Her name is Carol Sanford, S-A-N-F-O-R-D. And the book I would recommend, and it's not a big book, it's a thin book. It's only maybe about not even quite 200 pages. It's called The Regenerative Life. And it's transformate, transform any organization, our society, and your destiny. Really an interesting lady. You know, I've, I've come now to know her. I've had some friends who have really spent some architects that have worked with her and they have really influenced. She has really influenced her thinking. She she really is an interesting person. And that a lot of these things that I'm talking about is since I've been introduced to her things really is is bringing together, you know, many of those things. Peter Senge or any of those people. And the second book I really recommend is the guy who wrote the book Sapiens, uh, Yuval Henri Harry. He wrote Sapiens and then he wrote Homo Deus, A Brief History of the Future. But his next one is called 21 Questions for the 21st Century. And I would strongly recommend that because he really poses from, and remember, he's a historian, but he really poses the types of questions that we need to be considering as we move into this world of AI and high tech, et cetera. And I think it would be very, very uh, uh, educationally and really help people to think about the future. So those two books, even though you wanted one, I gave you two. It's okay. You're more than welcome. Anybody who's 73 gets two books. That's the rule from now on. <laughs> John, I just got to say thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to see you. You know, last time I made it to the East Coast, I hung out with you and Kate May. You know, the Vegas uh, door here is always open. So when we start moving around the country again more and more, let's make sure we reconnect and uh, spend some time together. This time we can go for a sale. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> once you Once you get that boat... Still up in, uh, what is it, Massachusetts, right? Maybe? This will be here uh, July 8th. <laughs> there you go. All right. Good. My friend, be well. Okay. Thank you very much. You too. So John graduated second in his class from the bottom. If you remember, Doc Dockery started his career as a hoodlum. I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit like an underachiever. Look, I said at the outset, you're going to find yourself replaying this episode to go deeper into what John is sharing in this talk. It's caused me to really think more deeply, as John always does with me, about how personal prosperity can be, how personal it can be. And I really think, at least for me, John is tapping or maybe a little bit through the door of something even greater. You know, I'm so glad that we, you and I, started this journey together. I am not the same person I was when we started, and that is exactly what I was hoping would happen. Prosperity. Understanding your relationship in a living environment. Having a sincere, deeper awareness. No longer compromising, but reconciling. Sounds like something even greater. Let me know what you think. You can send me an email at rem at toppractices.com. Prosperity is the entire focus of top practices. Most of our doctors are struggling with the business of medicine and those that aren't 
truly understand that through association with other successful doctors, they can take their success to the next level or to something even greater like prosperity. Prosperity in business is a function of mindset, marketing, and management. That is our mission at Top Practices. You can find out more about Top Practices, our annual marketing and management programs, our summit, our workshops for doctors at toppractices.com. Until next time, this is Rem Jackson. Smile when you wake up and then have a really great day. Nothing is more important.